Useno ninkilab leban lumin ni wedaye Manto lixyo diyo adigo layli fo gaban ah Wahba dhamban sidi lan quran lo haku digeye Liman ki lakwa dhaku akhriye way kullu miyene Lallab ki ay kushe gaye la sin ma ahayne Waxay kugu lugo ye njit ki la la dha ahay In Wajir district in Kenya's northeastern province, the majority of the population are nomadic pastoralists with herds of animals as their livelihood. Because of the scarcity of rainfall in this part of Kenya, the pastoralists require extensive areas in which to move in search of pasture and water. Conflicts among the Wajir clans over the control and use of these scarce resources is unavoidable. When in 1991-92, a terrible drought hit the district. The pastoralists lost up to 80% of their livestock. Hundreds of people were displaced in the search for food. Many had to rely on famine relief to survive. Exacerbating this situation was a huge influx of refugees from Ethiopia and Somalia who were fleeing the political chaos there. Along with them, weapons and mercenary soldiers entered Wajia district. The Kenyan administration declared a state of emergency. By the end of 1992, the situation in Wajir resembled a pressure cooker waiting to explode. And explode it did. In December 1992, following an election that changed the political balance in the district, fierce fighting erupted in several areas in Wajir. There was animal stock theft, highway robbery and hijacking of vehicles, looting and arson of homesteads, destruction of businesses, rape of women and children, injury and murder. By late 1993, almost no part of Wajir district was safe, and insecurity brought the normal activities to a halt. Most NGOs pulled out of the district, which greatly affected the relief work. Feelings of fear and mistrust pervaded all levels of society. The violence continued to escalate. There was a lot of tension and a lot of uh, conflict in Wajir. And uh, one of the evenings, uh, we decided to go for a wedding in one of the houses in a place called South Sea. And in that wedding, the gathering, uh, we overheard somebody saying that, what are we doing here? I think we better get home before somebody decides to do something bad. And uh, in that meeting, um, some of us decided that uh, what are we killing each other for? What is the problem? Why don't we sit and talk about it? And uh, that is where the idea of sitting and talking about the problem in Wajir started. And from then onwards, that is uh, ourselves, Rukia, Deka, myself, um, Ebla, and the other Rukia, started going to members in the community, especially women, to ask them to come together and discuss what the problems are in Wajir and see how we, can, we are going to solve these problems. And uh, we decided that we are going to have meet with the women because there was a lot of tension and a lot of conflict, especially in the market areas where women, it reached a stage where you, if you are a member of a particular community, you are not able to buy something from another member of another community. So the tension was so high. And in that meeting, we realized that what is happening is not just a women's problem. It's a, it's a manifestation of a bigger things happening in the society that is being seen at the marketplace. It's being reflected in the marketplace by women refusing uh, to sell each other milk, to sell each other vegetables, to talk to one another, to show you that things were, were brewing up. And in that meeting, you know, we chose Mama Fadumah Mohammed Mire and a group of other ten women to be monitoring the market every morning to go and see what's happening. For example, if a woman refuses the other uh, woman from another clan from entry, that shows that they're still not reconciled, they're still not happy. So uh, the, the committee that was formed that day was helping to practically put the, what, we are, what we agreed upon into practice so that women can share space they can sell, they can buy from one another, and they can enter the market uh, together. So myself, Rukia, and Orai, 
and Amran went to the district commissioner. We told him of the initiative we started with women. He commended us for the initiative, and he agreed that in future he will be calling uh, the women to come and uh, to come for peace meeting. Thus, the Wajir Women's Association for Peace was born. The assumption was that although there are significant national and international causes of the violence in Wajir, the conflict was local and could therefore be addressed locally. As the Women's Committee continued to be successful in stopping conflict in the market areas, the women decided to take the initiative further and address those directly involved in the fighting. These were the elders of all the clans. It's good we can talk to women, it's good we can talk to children, but we should confront the elders. So the idea of going to talk to the elders was not an easy one. So we sat and brainstormed and we said, how do we go forward? We were about, I think, 15, and we said, less strategies. We agreed that uh, first uh, we should uh, see how many tribes do we have here, clans. We said we have three, the three major clans and then we have the minority clans, which in Wajia we refer to as the corner tribe. So we said every one of us should go to the people uh, you are, they are coming from. Let's inform the government with what, we, what we are trying to do. So again, uh, Amran and Mohammed were told, were sent to meet the district commissioner and inform him on what is happening so that there is no suspicion so that they know we are doing this in our capacity as uh, children from Wajia. The first meeting we had with the elders was, uh, there was a lot of suspicion. The elders from the different clans thought that this was a waste of time, that nobody wanted to listen to anybody else. And uh, I think we were impressed very, very strongly by an elder who came from one of the corner tribes, who was from uh, Bulawa Beri. He was a gary old man, very eloquent, very, you know, he, he knew what he was talking about. And I think we made him our, kind of our spokesman, mm -hmm. because we thought that these are the three major clans actually, you know, fighting, quarreling and all that. And this, uh, this corner tribe, that they're, they're a minority, so they don't have much stake in anything. So they, they could be the middle ground to try to bring these three together. So we made that elder, you know, to be our spokesman. And he sat there and told them, gentlemen, do you want to keep fighting or are we going to stop fighting? And what are we fighting for? And who is responsible? Actually, he asked those questions. Who is responsible for the fighting which is going on? And are you happy that it stops or you want it to continue? And everybody, whether they wanted it or not, said, we don't want it to continue. We want it to stop. He said, if you want this fighting to stop, then we have to take certain steps. Are we ready? Are you able to represent your clan? To say that if you give some certain you know, directives to your clan, that they're going to abide by it. And of course everybody wanted to be the one you know, responsible enough to give something for his clan. After the women, together with concerned men, had began the peace process, they mobilized the elders to continue. A series of meetings between the clan elders took place. The Elders for Peace group was formed, and a meeting was organized by the local member of parliament. At this gathering, the so-called Al-Fatah Declaration was agreed on. This declaration stated guidelines for the return of peace to the district. It led to the formation of investigative teams made up of elders from each clan. Because of the makeup of these teams, the public trusted them to discover the truth about crimes and to make fair judgments so that justice could be achieved. In their efforts to resolve conflict, the elders often had to expose themselves to danger. Let me give you an example. One day a fight erupted between the East and the North constituency. People from Wajir East had raided animals from the Wajir North. We received a report of this. Now chairman gave me the responsibility of solving this conflict. I went out to prepare for the mission. I went around to all the clans and from each clan I picked two representatives. 
By this time, hundreds of raided camels were already being brought into Wajir East, where I come from and where my community is settled. Our group totaled 15 elders, all given the responsibility of returning these camels. We found the place and confronted the bandits. We were able to capture 50 guns and all the camels. This is because we had faith in God. Anybody who has faith in God will not be harmed. This is what I learned at that time. They fired at us and I led the elders away while the bandits followed us. I told them to stop firing. In the end, we succeeded in our mission and returned the guns to the government and the camels to the owners at Buna. The camels were handed over to the owners at a grand meeting witnessed by al Fatah elders and government representatives. After that, al Fatah members went to visit all divisions where we held more meetings. We used an egg as a symbol. Anybody who breaks it has broken the peace. We gave one egg to every division of elders and up to now all the eggs are there. Since that time, peace has been attained and no conflict has been reported between East and North. Declarations, symbols and rituals are important ways to celebrate peace. An annual festival was organized to forgive and honor, in public, those who work towards peace. During these festivals, the elders are given the responsibility to elect those chiefs who did most to advance the peace effort amongst their clan. The festivals are able to raise funds badly needed by the peace groups. It was agreed that for the people of Wajir to feel that the peace belongs to them, the money to sustain it would have to be raised locally. Local businessmen were addressed and contributed funds as they realized that peace was essential to sustain business. The Wajir Peace Group began working with other groups in Wajir. The youth were a major target. They were being used to initiate the violence by those in power. A Youth for Peace Group was soon started. So the youth converged in April 1994 with uh, so many objectives, but the first two major being one, to achieve a sustainable peace. The second, then engaging youth in development projects so that they may not participate in this uh, bloodshed in the future. Uh, we had to discourage the youth from fighting because we saw that so many of them were losing their lives in the battle. And then the issue of telling us that we are future leaders, we were seeing that we will not have future leaders. So we had to say enough is enough and uh, tell the youth that they should not stop, they should not participate in these ongoing clashes. Okay, we told uh, the youth in the various sub-locations and locations to form youth groups that will talk to their colleagues who are in the bush to stop this and surrender the illegal guns to the authorities concerned. And at least that was a step we saw a very, very positive response. Uh, as we were going around uh, the areas that were hit by clashes, we were advocating for peace. And uh, the group comprised of a cross section of the youth from all walks of life in Wajia district. So when uh, our parents and relatives and those people were involved in the clashes in those areas so that uh, at least we had uh, started a positive move, they also followed suit by saying, if our children can initiate such an example, why, why not follow them? So, as such, we started seeing people developing a positive attitude towards bringing about peace. While the war was continuing, you met some youths who were propagating peace. Yes, I met them. The day my children were killed, I ran away from home. I left my house, my land. I couldn't bear to stay there. I just couldn't believe what had happened. 
For almost 25 months, I was going from one place to another on my own. My mind wasn't at peace. And then some youth came to talk to the people in the area I was in. What was your feeling about the boys' group when they first arrived and they asked you to attend a peace meeting? I was not interested in attending any meeting. My heart was burning and I didn't want to listen. The first day I didn't listen. The second day I didn't listen. But on the third day I sat down in the meeting. That day a boy among the youth group talked a lot and his words made me calm down. The boy said, people are killed in different ways. Some are killed by the hands of human beings, others by water, still others by drought or by diseases or by vehicles. He said people from both sides of the war are killed. We all have suffered from one another. We want people to feel good in their heart and to join hands and to speak together. We have to forgive each other. We also want everybody to be patient. We are sorry for all the problems you have had. We are your children and we would like you to listen to our advice so we can stop this conflict. The words of that boy were spiritually and morally good for me. What he said was like a cool breeze going through my heart. Women have traditionally been extremely important in the process of peace and conflict in Somali society. When fighting is going on, they sing songs of war, taunting their men to continue the conflict. Likewise, their singing songs of peace can shame the men into stopping the fighting. It was because of this that the women's effort towards peace was well respected amongst the men. Some women, like Fatima Mohammed Mire, were even given the title of an honorary elder and invited to sit with the elders' council. Though in principle respected, they still had to overcome prejudices from time to time. I can remember a time when I used to walk with the 36 elders as the only woman. I can remember a man asking me, why is it that you're the only woman working with these men? I told him, if your house is burned, would you wait for a man to come or would you extinguish it yourself? He told me he would extinguish it himself. So I said, my house is on fire and I'm going to extinguish it. Just like the women peace workers, the youth also had to overcome prejudices before they were taken seriously. We got some elders who are quite some very arrogant, you saw. They were telling us, okay, what can you tell us? You people who were born just yesterday. We have been seeing things, these things for the last 40 or 50 years. So how some, can somebody 20 years old or something like uh, a teenager come and tell us the, the, that they are coming to advise? See, with elders, they believe that they are quite intelligent, they are wise. Eh? See, some of the elders, that's not all. Wajia district is underdeveloped in comparison to the rest of Kenya. Even in times of peace, it lags significantly in infrastructure, education and economic development. This means that the figures for unemployment, especially for young people, are extremely high. So we also saw that most of these things that bring about uh, clashes are idle youth. So we saw how can we engage this youth in an, at least an active part of social activity so that uh, they may stop being idle. So we saw that at least we should start social activities like football, tournaments, games and such a like thing. We also sat down and uh, revisited the idea of reviving the Wajia Youth Polytechnic which uh, went dead during those uh, period of clashes. So we saw that most of these idle youth who are taking the guns could be brought at least get uh, and get some formal training in the Wajia Youth Polytechnic. The youth have been participating in various other projects. Some of them are employed by the government. 
some of them are participating in the other jobs like uh, producing whitewash, uh, producing some stones for building, and so many other activities that are available within the community. They have just gone back to the resources available. Income generating schemes were important, not only for the youth. One of the other aims of the Wajia Peace Group was to identify the ex-militia and help them develop a non-violent lifestyle with alternative income possibilities. This is Diso Kasim and his family. He was identified as a major leader of a militia group. So today we will, uh, I will uh, ask Diso to tell us why he joined uh, the militia and uh, a bit about uh, a little bit background about his, his, his family and his life before and after the work we did with him. Were you involved in the previous fighting in Wajir? And if so, what steps did you take? I took part in the previous problem of Wajir. The tribal clashes coincided with the government of Somalia collapsing, which brought numerous arms into our country. We took the guns and we fought for many times. What happened was that a lot of animals were raided from us and we were left with nothing. This forced us to take up guns and take revenge. How did you get hold of the guns? Did you buy them or were they given to you by the clan? When I was in Wajir, the elders came to me because I had a reputation for being a fighter. They asked me to take part in the fight. I was given a gun and fought and managed to get hold of some more guns from the clan we were fighting against. I used those guns also, and when the fighting cooled a bit, I went to the eastern province into hiding, because by now I was a wanted man. The army, the military and the police were looking for me. My name was quite infamous. When I came back to Wajir, they were still after me. So I talked to the elders and told them that my children are here, and I was born here, and I don't want to live anywhere else. I surrendered to the military without the consent of the chiefs. I just went to the military. I didn't wait for them to come to me. When there is hunger and poverty, people become idle. In this area there is no activity to engage in, like farming. We decided to ask the government for assistance. The district commissioner gave me 6,000 shillings with which we bought two donkeys. My wife also advised me not to go back into the bush. She said this hunger will end and we shall look for peace and join in the peace work. She wanted peace, so I must also want peace. I then participated and removed 46 guns from the team that I was leading in the fighting. A program for the return of guns was initiated and proved very successful. People felt more and more secure and realized that the danger of retaining the guns outweighed their worth. An amnesty was granted to those who returned their weapons to the government. As a way to prepare the ground for reconciliation, workshops for religious leaders were organized. Several preaching tours of the entire district were undertaken by Christian and Islamic leaders to call people back to the rejection of violence. I think we had various, everybody trying to, on his own to resolve the conflict. You know, the youth have tried, the elders have tried, the women have tried. And in 1994, when we had a window of peace, we decided that uh, we cannot work on ad hoc basis. We need to work and bring all these initiatives together. And uh, March, uh, May 1995, we had the, the Wajia Peace and Development being formed by pulling together the elders, the youth, the women, the district security committee, members from the NGO community, uh, and uh, the members of parliament. We sat down for about two weeks to brainstorm, how do we make this, how do we consolidate? We have peace today, but we want to have that peace you know, going on. We do not want the peace to stop, because it's a process. You know, 
you can have peace and if you sleep you know you can revert back you can go back but how do we move forward in order to legitimize the peace effort and weave together the existing community and government structures, the Wajir Peace and Development Committee became a part of the District Development Committee. Thus all groups who have a stake in peace are included in the decision-making process. The Wajir Peace Group, together with the district administration, had to try and find the proper balance between the traditional Somali system of justice and the Kenyan constitutional law. A rapid response team was set up to deal with problems as they came up. This was especially important as criminal acts of individuals could soon lead to the involvement of whole clans, which would then mean an escalation of violence. The rapid response team consisted of members of the district security committee, elders from various clans, women and youth. When problems were reported in a certain area, the team would travel to that area, secure evidence, and meet with all sides involved to work on resolving the problem. Thus, a new structure was created that allowed local people to deal with conflict quickly to prevent it from escalating into clan wars. So far, I think uh, there are about three rape cases. The latest the one that involved a young girl of, of about seven years uh, she was raped in Bula Gudade, which is in Wajia town. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the issue was almost taking a political dimension because the young girl comes from the Rero Mahmoud clan, which is the clan that lost in the last parliamentary election in Wajia West. And the young man who raped her came from the uh, Jibrail clan, which is the winning clan. So what was a criminal act? Today the criminal is in the hands of the police in police custody. He's being uh, interrogated and he'll be taken to court. But uh, we intervened in this because we needed to prevent any further escalation of the problem, any further rape. Uh, last week, uh, Friday afternoon, as women, we met, we discussed and we said, this is not a problem of that sub-clan, it's a problem of all the women here because as mothers we are concerned uh, about uh, the safety of our girls and the safety, the health of this young girl who has been raped and we do not want the offended clan to go out because by going out and revenging means another innocent girl getting raped. So we wanted to prevent that. We said we must meet the leaders of the young girl uh, clan so that they can talk to the young men so that they do not revenge because we wanted to assure them that this is not their problem, but it's a district problem, it's, it's the problem of all of us. So we did not want this criminal act to take a political dimension. So we went and talked to the, the elders in the Rero Mahmoud clan, the chiefs, and actually the chiefs, when we went and talked to them, they said last night and the previous night they were stopping 50 young men from taking action. Taking action means you know, uh, maybe killing another innocent person, raping another innocent girl. So he said, we will be waiting from you, so we will not take any action. We thought that is not enough. Uh, Sunday afternoon uh, last week, uh, I and a group of L uh, ladies visited that same village where the young girl was raped. We talked to the women and we talk, to, told them of the strategies of the things that we've done. And as Halima mentioned earlier, Somali women have capacity to create war and have capacity to bring peace. If they use that incident to raise the emotion of the young men, then they can really send all the young men uh, on a spree of either killing or looting or raping. So we, we urged them to work towards peace to avoid any other little girl from being raped. Before 1992, the government used to send an army. The army will blanketly beat up everybody. We have now moved away from that. We have moved away from that and we are sending out the elders to talk to people and to f for the people themselves to flush out who is the criminal within them. I think we have to be patient because this is a very slow process. In order for the piecework to remain effective, it has to be accompanied by in-depth analysis of the situation. To acquire these skills, a number of people have attended conflict resolution courses 
both in Kenya and abroad. So we all we read uh, books or we get to know some uh, tools for analysis, but we modify it and use it uh, towards our own situation. For us to get durable peace in the district, we thought we should do a lot of uh, education campaign in terms of changing the people's thinking and uh, reorientate them towards peace. Uh, some of the trainings that we've been undertaking was uh, leadership training for chiefs. Chiefs are, uh, they are all over in the district and they are, uh, they are, you know, people who are with the community at the village level. They are people who are with the community in all, in all aspects of the district. So they give us a structure that runs from the district to the village level and we thought that would be an opportunity for us to help them think towards peace, orientate them towards peace. Uh, in the workshop that we've been undertaking, uh, we've been looking, we've been using various tools and uh, we've been undertaking uh, to enable us to think in terms of what is peace and defining it. And also looking at indicators. What indicates we have peace and what indicates that we do not have peace? And uh, we in Wajir, we've modified the, the stages of conflict. It was earlier what we call the conflict curve in in the books of conflict, but here we call it the camel's back because as being pastoralist, this curve reminds us of the camel's back. And uh, we have tried to look at uh, indicators. What indicates that we are in a pre-conflict uh, situation? What indicates that we are in a pre-conflict situation is like rumors. Once you see that there are rumor and rumor mongering and war of words, that tells you that uh, there is a uh, there's something happening within that community. Although the violence is now over, the roots of the conflict still need to be addressed. And today we have achieved a relative peace within the district. We've managed to reconcile the, the various warring clans within Wajia district. And today we have peace within Wajia. But the conflict is far from over because we have neighbors who are unstable, we have neighboring countries that are unstable, and problems come because we are part and parcel of the wider Kenyan groups, and we have now problems with our neighboring district. When people move and meet, then conflicts are bound to happen, and that requires for us to have fresh thinking on the whole process and how we can expand uh, this uh, process so that when our neighbors are having peace, then it is peace for us. Then we should, have, we should see how we can cooperate and do that. On cause gugu gu lembano ho derer ka aulele. That's all rugma de bano ho do hadi yimie. And or doro da balban kumari dolo i hirane. Da ya iyo shamsana hai hadan lay da firi hainin. Good ur du me haben da man dal kan da al kano raining. But then you do tell a bada had done doga maria. Duxi had done la gelin the hunt while the good do low by it. The bailey he of four a let take it there were hangalin. There you laugh, you done, she done, hiya dog, you are well.